All right, let's move on to 780 and 781. And these two are together because 781 does not go into effect unless 780 is passed. So um, we have with us speaking on, in favor of 780 and 781 is Leslie Briggs. And um, so if you want to come on up here and then um, we'll provide some opposition to it here in just a second. <laughs> well, you know, we have to. <laughs> that's what America's all about. That's right, that's right. So first of all, I should say thanks for having me out here. My name is Leslie Briggs, and I work for an organization called Oklahomans for Criminal Justice Reform. And right now we're working on these two state questions, and they differ from every other state question in that they are not constitutional. They're statutory, and they're statutory by design because when you start to think about changing the way that we punish people who do bad in our society, you need to be able, it can't be permanent, right? We need to be able to, if it, if the, if the reforms need to be adjusted, we need to be able to do that. So that's why they're statutory by design. So let me tell you a little bit about both questions, and then uh, I'm happy to take your questions. So 780 is a reform bill. What this will do is it will reclassify certain low-level uh, nonviolent offenses from felonies to misdemeanors. So just some statistics here. In 2008, one in 12 Oklahomans was a felon. Let me say that again. In 2008, that was eight years ago, one in 12 Oklahomans was a felon. That is an incredibly high proportion of our population that are, that are unfit to work or unfit to live among us, right? Because a felony is the most grievous type of crime that you can commit, okay? And so I would then submit to you guys that we have so expanded uh, our government's idea of what can be considered a felony, that one in 12 Oklahomans are now felons. And that is a, I think that is a, a grievous expansion of state control over taking away your liberties as an individual. So a felony, historically, was actually a crime that was punishable by death. Today, if you uh, commit uh, larceny, you steal something, $500 or more, that's a felony. Now, let me, give you, let me just give you an anecdote here. I used to work in Vinfield Public Schools, and uh, we had a situation where a 12-year-old kid was joking around with a mentor, a volunteer mentor that had come to the school to be with them, and had taken her phone and hid it, okay? So this 12-year-old kid made a stupid decision, right? She took, she took an iPhone from her mentor to play a joke and hid it. Well, of course, as we all would, I mean, my whole life is on this thing, the mentor freaked out and went to the administration and said, I think someone in the class that I was just in took my phone. Can we figure out a way to get it back? And so the dean of discipline, who's a tough guy, who, who you know, when you're 12, I don't know, anybody in here have a 12-year-old? Somebody who's 13, that mean there? You gotta be tough with them. But he came into the classroom and he threatened the classroom with a felony charge. Now, I'm not saying that he was out of line doing that because that's, that's the law, right? That kid could have been charged with a felony for playing a joke. Now imagine, the impact on that child's life, right? Being tagged as a felon from age 12 onward, can't get a job when they get, if they were sent, you know, if they were in fact sentenced to a, a time in a juvenile detention, detention center, but you're, you're a felon, you're tagged like that. You can't get a job. Who in here would hire a felon to come work for them? Not many, right? Not many, so, well, you got one over here, that's good. Hey, you know what, they need jobs. They need to become productive members of society, and that actually breaks the cycle of crime. So, but because of the fact that so many of our citizens are in fact tagged as felons, our governor got rid of the, the box on the applications that requires you to check whether or not you've been convicted of a felon because they couldn't get enough people to apply for state jobs, okay? It's, that's how dire the situation is in Oklahoma. So 780 would uh, effectively reduce that by um, making simple possession. Now we're not talking about distribution or manufacture, we're talking about having the amount of drug on you that constitutes possession. That would become a misdemeanor punishable by up to a $1,000 fine and, uh, say it again? 12 months. 12 months in jail. All right, so you're still, gonna, you're still gonna serve your time in our prison system. You're still gonna be punished for that crime, but you're not gonna be a felon when you get out. You're gonna be able to get a job. And uh, the second reform actually kind of mirrors what our legislature passed at the end of the, I'm super nervous. 
I don't usually speak. I don't usually speak at these things, so I'm like, oh, I've got so much to say. So uh, the, the second part of the reform is a, is a change in uh, a property crime. So it raises that threshold from 500 to 1,000, meaning that the 12 year old kid now steals two iPhones in order to be threatened with a felony. Okay? So, um, Though that's 780. That's what we're really trying to do. It's a reclassification. It's not a new law. It's an amendment to a law that already exists. Uh, and it's 781. Now, what are we going to do with these people who are suffering from some kind of addiction, who have been caught with drugs on them? What are we going to do if we don't keep them, if we don't put them in prison for long periods of time? 781 is going to take money that we save by from um, by not having these people in our system for excessive amounts uh, uh, of years. It's going to save the state an estimated $25 million. We're going to take that $25 million and we're going to put it back in local county control. Okay? So the people sitting around this room, we could go up, call, their, their, call your mayor, call whoever your, rep, your district uh, city council rep is, and uh, tell them how you want the, that money to be spent. All right? So you get the control back. You get to tell them how they're going to spend your taxes, and you don't. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not creating any new funding source except for what's already being paid by y'all right now. Does that make sense? All right. I'm getting through it. I'm getting through it. <laughs> they don't send me out to speak. I don't know if you can tell that. No. I got the email saying it started at 7.30 and my boss was like, you're going. And I was like, All right. <laughs> so here I am. Those are the reforms though. So it's not, it's, it's, it's amending a statute that is not providing any new kind of tax. It's redirecting money you're already paying to provide services that we know in the long run prevent crime. We know if we can take someone who is addicted to a drug, treat them, get them off of that drug, get them into work, and make them a productive member of society, our communities will be safer in the long run. I can promise you that. That is my spiel. I am done. Uh, okay. So let me know. Got questions? I'm ready for them. Next room. Um, I'm kind of going to, I'm going to give you a scenario. Yes, ma'am. Car break-ins. Yes which are, there's lots of them. Okay, so the first time you break into the car and you take something out of the car, it's a misdemeanor, right? It would depend on the amount of okay, property but, stolen. But I'm under, if this passes, it would be a misdemeanor if it's under $500. Under 1000 Under 1000 okay, under 1000 I get that, it's a misdemeanor. But what if they break into next week another car and another car and another car and another Great car? Great question. Now, now, is it still a misdemeanor? I mean, they. The answer is actually no. So it's an aggregate. So if you if you steal 500 the first time, uh, great misdemeanor. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. give you the sentence and not tag you to felony, and hopefully get you into some kind of program, job training, vocational training, something. Tulsa Reentry here works here in town with with people just like that who have no skills and need skills to be marketable. So the first time 500 dollars, no. You go, come back and you steal another 600 dollars. It's an aggregate. Now you've committed a felony. You're going to go to jail for a lot longer time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so they just add up however much right. you stole it. Right, right, over time. Yes, in the back. Well, we, we drop, we throw figures out like $500. Well, to at least some of us in here, there really isn't anything. But some people, that's crushing. Yeah. It ruins their life. They might not be able to make a payment if, if it was cash that was stolen. Um, I don't care about the person who stole. I care about the person who got stolen from. Absolutely. It's not Absolutely. right to peg a, a certain, you know, just put a number in there, and then because some people are not on the same playing field. Yeah, and five hundred dollars ain't gonna hurt me. I, I agree. Yeah, it might, might hurt somebody over here really bad. Absolutely. And that's more than a misdemeanor if it's hurt somebody really bad. Right. So. So I think um, just to put it in perspective, um, Texas passed a similar law a few years ago. Um, raising their property crime threshold to $1,500, which is $500 more than what we're asking for here. They've actually seen, because that money's been diverted to programs that provide skills trainings in the prisons, they've seen uh, a drop in their property crime over the last, I think it's been eight years now. So, so, so does the person who steals $500 from somebody have to pay it back? Because that person over here has been hurt to a, to a felony level, they're hurt. Yeah. So this person just goes to jail for a few months, never has to pay this person back? So wouldn't it be, yeah. wouldn't it be 
you know, shouldn't there be a restitution if you're going to say, well, now you can hurt people twice as bad before you go to jail? Yeah. Shouldn't there be a restitution factor put into something like that? I would, I would absolutely say yes from a personal level. I would, these reforms don't include that. But as I mentioned before, they are statutory by design. So if we wanted to add that in later, it would be a much easier fix. Yes. Since it's statutory, what prevents the legislature from changing the 12 months from now back to what it is today? Yeah, so absolutely nothing. Um, and so, but I will say this that, this, that the legislature at the end of their last session, um, the property crimes piece, they actually passed legislation that, that raised it. Um, so we're just kind of, it's kind of like we're just saying, yes, we, we support that legislation that was already passed. It already happened through the legislature. Um, I mean, I know many of us may be dissatisfied about the, the legislature did the jobs. And I mean, no disrespect to our representatives that are here today, but um, that's why these groups exist. That's why I think groups like Tulsa 912 exist, because y'all can get together and you have the power of the people to call up your representative and tell them and have, make them do what, what you want them to do. Yes? Uh, can a felon, if say a, a young man in their teens and they do something and they get the felon on their record, uh, how many years is there a law that will take that and allow someone to get that expunged yeah. if they become a productive citizen uh, and don't get in trouble anymore? So uh, expungement is not something I'm super well versed in. I know that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it works. So can, I'll talk to that as an employer. I, um, we we, we're a general contractor. We work in people's homes. I'm on a number of insurance programs. I have to do background checks on all of my subcontractors and employees. And the answer is that if that I cannot employ as a subcontractor or an employee anybody who has ever had a felony in their life. And um, it, it does show up on the background check even though when it's like expunged or whatever. And I have to forward those, and I'll get kicked off the program if I employ somebody. And I think that's, on DUIs, after three years, insurance companies are not able to take that into account in your driver's record. And I just learned recently that after about seven years, after paying your, you know, doing your jail time, doing whatever, um, if a person hasn't reoffended, then the chance of them reoffending are about the same as the general population. So. I see that right now as an issue that, that I'd like to see addressed, but if the answer is it will show up on your background check forever right now. So could you give me that statistic again about reoffending that you just said? If a person, I was just at a conference and this was one of the topics, but if a person, once they've committed a felony, done their jail time, their probation, and over a period of if they've gone seven years without reoffending, mm, mm. then the odds of them committing another felony drop to about the same as the general population. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so just to, to kind of jump off of that, um, to, again, Tulsa Reentry is a program that provides vocational training and skills training and um, is about to begin job placement with um, uh, people who are getting out of the system, whether they have a misdemeanor, misdemeanor or felony. Um, and they have a 85% a non-recidivism rate. And if, um, so if we can fund programs like that that are turning people who are otherwise breaking into cars or, 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 steal, or you know, stealing your phone out of your back pocket, turn them into someone with a skill set and then put them in a placement program as mandated by the courts in lieu of putting them in, in a prison, I think that we'll have safer communities in the long run. Yes. I have a quick question. Sure. So in Dallas County, in Texas, where I just moved from, sure. they have a program. Welcome. Happy. <laughs> Welcome. Um, we, they had a program there called Divert Court that basically took whatever restitution, somebody steals from somebody, they were supposed to pay that money back instead of putting them in. And then t I'm just making sure I'm clarifying what, you're, what you guys are Absolutely, trying to do yeah. here based on what you wrote out here. Um, so basically, that money that would be either tied to how much it would be to imprison them. And then the restitution would be used right towards a rehabilitation treatment program, maybe 12 months, something like that. And then 
like you said, the reentry program is, are, are you, you're basically taking those funds and allocating them so what that we do, direction? Yes. Or how, how the, I, I'm wondering where the funds are. Is it yes. through restitution? What is, is it's it not through restitution. So it's through tax dollars that you already pay into the system. So by not, not by not putting people in prison, we are estimating that we will save so about one in six people go in on on a uh, simple drug possession that are admitted to that. About ten percent uh, of the overall admissions are property crimes. So there's a large portion of, of people going into the system that, that, that these reforms would affect, and we are estimating on the low end right now in the first year that we would save the state around twenty five million dollars. Um, if you couple that with the fact that it costs it costs between five and eight thousand dollars to treat someone in their community with these research-based programs like reentry, or if anyone's familiar with women in recovery, they treat addiction. Um, costs about between five and eight thousand to treat someone in the community, not being warehoused in our correctional system, um, and actually treating their problems. But so, so that money comes from the savings that are generated um, after uh, the first year of this being implemented. The Office of uh, Enterprise and Management will calculate the savings, and that money is uh, reallocated back to the back to the counties to decide how to spend. So the counties get to pick the programs they want to fund. The county wants to expand a drug court or a diversion program. That's well within their right under this. Did, that, did uh, I answer your question? Yes. Yes. Well, I think, what, is, what is it? I mean, I think they spend what twenty or thirty thousand a year for someone to be in jail. Yes. Yeah. Five to eight thousand for a program. Right. So it's it's. I mean, imagine the. And, our, and just to add, our crime rates have gone up over the last 10 okay. years, so the, your money's being spent and it's not getting you any kind of positive result. What we know here is that, like I just mentioned, those two programs, reentry and Women in Recovery, Women in Recovery has a 94% success rate getting people off drugs and placed in the community and, and being productive members of society. If we can get them more money to treat more people, Overall, that's better for Tulsa and Oklahoma as a whole. Right. Can you Let's go off? ahead, and okay. uh, Peggy wanted to offer uh, as a few opposing opinions. Well, we had uh, Mr. Hunsweiler, the district attorney, and and uh, he is opposed to both of these measures. And I can remember some of his reasons, so I'll repeat them, and then you can just decide. Speak up a little bit. Okay. Uh, one of his objections is that it covers possession of all drugs. So it includes heroin, crack cocaine. It's not just marijuana. And he will tell you that a lot of times when you have a criminal that you can't necessarily catch dealing, you can catch him on possession. And he wants that to remain a felony because that's a bargaining tool. It's a, it's a way to get them off the street. He will also tell you that under this new law, since drug possession will become a misdemeanor, drug court requires a three-year commitment. And he, he claims, I don't know whether it's true or not, but he claims a lot of people will opt for the 12 months in the county jail or the 12 or the fine and will avoid going to the, taking on the three-year commitment of going through drug court. Um, could, I, could I counter that? I've heard, I, 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 um, I really respect Mr. Kingsweiler's his job and what he has to deal with on a daily basis. But I think um, two things that I think he, he, if I may, he gets wrong. And the first thing is that the majority of people who are out there who are addicted to drugs, when they're caught on simple possession, they are committing some other kind of crime. And so the leverage there to force them into drug court still exists because maybe they were in the process of committing a burglary to get the money to, to buy their next round of drugs. Uh, the leverage that he needs is not gonna go away. He's still gonna be able to say, look, I'm gonna charge you with this, I'm gonna charge you with that, I'm gonna charge you with this, unless you go to drug court and you complete the program, you're gonna go to jail. So I think that he still's gonna have his leverage, but I understand where he's coming from. Okay, and the other major argument he's making is when you raise the property crime and you raise the, the, the amount and everything, what you're going to be doing is you're gonna be pushing people down from state penal systems into the county. So you're going to see an increase in the number of people in county jail. And that's going to be an increase to the cost of county government. It relieves the state, but it pushes a lot of it down to the county. So these are issues you have to you know, weigh in balance, and, that, and that, those are the main arguments. All right. And Ms. Leslie will stick around for a few minutes afterwards so that she can answer any questions that we might have. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. 
because we just need to kind of move along real quick because we've got two more left.